Hello, we'd like to welcome you to the South Coast Best Producers Association podcast. I'm your host, Charles Riggins, treasurer of the South Coast Best Producers Association and owner of Riggins Homegrown Foods. The South Coast Best Producers Association is made up of growers, consumers, and other interested in producing, marketing, and supporting South Coast specialty crops, meats, and locally made products. We are bringing this podcast to help you get more get good information out about topics that are important to our members. Our first series of podcasts addresses the challenges of pest management, especially producers in our region. Each episode features a different type of crop and effective ways growers can implement various forms of IPM. In this episode, we'll discuss peppers and tomatoes. We are excited to have our special guest, Christine Lang. Lang is an assistant professor at and SDSU Extension Consumer Horticulture Specialist. Thank you so much for being here, Christine. It sounds like you have a great background in helping people with vegetable growing, and we'd like to right, look forward to getting your advice and expertise. Thank you, Charles. I'm happy to be here, and while I'm still very new to South Dakota, I am no stranger to the Midwest. <laughs> Good. I hope you stick around. Me too. <laughs> All right. Uh, as we approach the subject of integrated pest management, we'd like to start with uh, a discussion of prevention. Can you describe some of the steps that you advise producers can take to avoid pests and those types of crops? Yeah, certainly. You know, I I think the first thing to start with, and as you likely know, Charles, that the best prevention is a farmer's footsteps. I I strongly believe in in field scouting and you know getting on the ground and paying attention to what's happening with your crop and the conditions around you. Have we had you know a week's worth of cold cloudy wet weather um is it is it getting excessively hot are there weeds growing around the field or the high tunnel so i think paying attention to surroundings can give a lot of clues about what pests or diseases might be as an, an issue as we're going to get into as the conversation evolves um i i'm a really big fan of and maybe this is the scientist in me but i'm a really big fan of crop journals, um, you know, paying attention, keeping field records and observations, whether it's, you know, just putting different observations in a, in a calendar in your smartphone or keeping a record with photos or just having a pocket journal or notebook that you, you know, just a good old fashioned notebook that you're still carrying around with you out in the field um, to really pay attention to what's happening year over year. Of course, it's super important to to know your seed sources, whether you're sourcing those from a commercial seeds pro producer or if you are saving your own open pollinated seeds, making sure that you're, if you are saving your own seeds, that you're saving those from plants that aren't showing any signs of disease issues and storing those seeds in, you know, dry conditions, airtight containers um, in the dark. So that um, you're starting, you're starting yourself off right, um, and making sure that transplant media is from a from a clean, reliable source. Whether that is the soilless media, or if you are making soil blocks, that that soil has been sterilized properly, so you're not introducing any disease right from the beginning. Um, it's incredibly important to look for disease resistant varieties if you know you have a certain issue on your farm. Um, they, these are often designated on the label or catalog and described by letters. So some of the more common resistances that have been bred into tomatoes and peppers and especially tomatoes is resistance to verticillium wilt, fusarium wilt, root knot nematode. Again, we're not, um, root knot nematode, I wouldn't expect to see up here, and verticillium wilt and fusarium typically aren't an issue either, but something to be aware of. Um, resistance to tobacco mosaic virus and tom tomato spotted wilt virus, those are really important because the, the only treatment for those is to remove the entire plant from the field because it is vectored by insects. So um, if just starting clean and starting with clean transplants is a great first step. 
um, you know, with my, my, my background, I, I did a PhD in sustainable vegetable production at Iowa State University. And I spent a lot of time growing in high tunnels. And whether it's the field or especially within a high tunnel, making sure you have good airflow is incredibly important. So as you think about bed design, as, as some of the folks who listen to this might know, but if you are a beginning grower, making sure that beds are centered five to six feet apart on center. And some of that might depend on the equipment you're using, whether it's open field or high tunnel. But with peppers, having that plant spacing one to one and a half feet apart within the row. And if you are gonna use double rows, having one and a half feet between rows and one foot between plants or with between those double rows and making sure that's staggered. Um, research has shown, you know, different ways to optimize pepper, pepper plant spacing, and this is this is the recommendation, especially for the Midwest. As you think about tomato spacing, if you have determinate tomatoes, so those are again tomatoes that are going to grow to, you know, that terminal bud is going to blossom, and and that's it. It's not going to get any taller. You will have suckering around the rest of the plant, but typically determinate tomatoes tend to be smaller. You have your fruit set um, more more closely together, and you're not going to have a continuous fruit set or tomato that's continuing to grow and grow and grow. And with those determinate tomatoes, the recommendation is one and a half feet apart within a single row. And using a basket weave, or sometimes you'll hear this called a Florida steak and weave, is a really important step in keeping those plants upright, making it easier to harvest, and again, helping with airflow. And so when you do that system, you put a stake typically between you'll have a stake for every two plants and then you're using a tomato twine and several several rows as the plant grows if you're doing a florida stake and weave you're actually weaving between every stake and every tomato plant if you're using more of a, a standard weave here in the midwest typically you're tying on to each of those tomato stakes and then going around the outside of the plants and kind of lifting them upright. Another way to help with airflow on determinate tomatoes is pruning leaves off to the first cluster. Um, you don't want to go, you don't need to go any higher than that, but getting some airflow through the bottom of the plant is helpful. And then you're also preventing leaves from touching the soil surface, which could be another opportunity for introduction of disease. If you're working with indeterminate tomatoes, especially inside of a high tunnel system, uh, the recommendation is to plant double rows with one foot between rows and two feet between plants. And again, that's on a stager. And as some of you might know, you'd be doing this on a trellised system. So sometimes you'll see a roller hook system or you might be just tying all the way up to tying, tying to the, uh, the trusses of the high tunnel. But getting those, getting those plants upright and pruning to a single leader. So every, every leaf axle, you would be removing the sucker from, from those leaf axles. And making sure that pruning tools are sanitized is really important as well. Thanks, Jay. Um, what kind of types of plants would you suggest if you're just starting out into high tunnels, is there one type that works better than other types in your opinion? So based on my research, I if if growers are looking to use, you know, a standard slicing tomato, we uh, work that I've done has been done with BHN 589. So that is a numbered, a numbered tomato that performs really well for growers here in the Midwest. Um, some other tomatoes that might be good options, especially in terms of disease resistance, would be Mountain Magic as well as Mountain Merit. Other recommendations for, for here in South Dakota include Iron Lady and Jasper. And if you're looking for um, some of the cherry tomatoes, Lemon Drop is one that has some tolerance to, to late blight. And based on some input from local foods, there's a cherry tomato called Sakura, Sakura 
that has performed really well here at SDSU. And again, that would just be an observation. I don't have any data to show that yet, but I look forward to being able to present some data on heirloom tomatoes after this, after this growing season. Uh, what about peppers? Well, based on data that I collected and um, published from Iowa State University, there are several options that would perform well within a high tunnel, especially if you're interested in producing colored bell peppers. So research that I've worked on looked at the production of red, yellow, orange, and purple bell peppers within high tunnels. And the data from our study showed on a per plant basis, there were slight differences in the number of marketable fruit per plant, but when you looked at the, the overall weight of fruit per plant, it was basically a wash. So um, tequila is a purple variety of pepper and those peppers tend to be a little bit smaller. And so you get more fruit per plant, but um, um, so in comparison to the other peppers, there were more fruit per plant, but uh, looking across the board at the other varieties, we had Red Knight and Archimedes that both had very nice large bell peppers. And for yellow varieties, we had Delirio. We had, I, I'll correct that. We For yellow varieties, we had Flavor Burst, Sirius and Summer Sweet, all of which also performed well. Based on observations, flavor bursts tend to ripen a bit sooner than the other yellows. So if you were looking for an earlier ripening time, uh, flavor bursts might be a good option. And then Delirio is actually an orange pepper and that one also performed well in our study. So um, as, far as, as far as plant performance, those would be, and again, that was data from Iowa, but that would translate fairly well in a high tunnel to South Dakota. So those, those seven cultivars would be a good place to start if you were looking for high tunnel production. And Red Knight has been used in a lot of research, also in open fields. So that one, that one would be a good red bell pepper for open field or, um, or for high tunnel production systems. Okay. Well, on watering, is a high tunnel compared to a field? Uh, do you need to water less in the high tunnel because of the humidity or keep it the same? I guess I can't cite any one study on that off the top of my head, but based on my observations and my own production scheduling experiences, we kept it about the same. One thing to pay attention to is and I, this would be from experience that I had while doing my research is pay attention to the grading around your high tunnel. Um, we had a case where our high tunnel actually ended up being the lowest point and the, the drainage, the drain tile system installed around the high tunnel had become clogged. So suddenly the high tunnel became the holding area for the water <laughs> for a few weeks there. But typically our, the watering schedule stayed between an inch to an inch and a half a week. Um, we did use tensiometers to kind of calibrate that and make sure we were staying on track for watering. And realizing that both for tomatoes and peppers, your critical watering periods are gonna be flowering through fruit set. But um, keeping that water, you know, I know we always think about the recommendation when we talk to gardener, gardeners, for example, if annual flowers or lawn or turf grass, things of that nature, that you wanna do a deep and infrequent watering. And while that is great advice, when we think about watering tomatoes and peppers, you're better off spreading that watering across three to four events in a week if you are able to. Um, both tomatoes and peppers are very susceptible to blossom end rot. And while that is a result of calcium deficiency, what actually causes that, um, or the best way to correct that is having even watering so that calcium uptake remains consistent. Our soils here in South Dakota, typically the pH is gonna be above six and therefore additional calcium you know, within a fertilizer may not be as important as having even watering to, to prevent blossom end rot. 
So that would be one thing I would really stress producers if you're having trouble with blossom end rot, especially in your high tunnel. The, the great thing with a high tunnel is you can control that watering schedule, whereas that's more difficult in open field conditions. Okay, um, what you were talking about blossom and rot, and uh, I know people use shade cloth for tomatoes and peppers. Uh, is there a recommendation on which works better for shade cloth and pest management? Yeah, so in terms of one big reason for sh shade cloth use would be to prevent issues with sun scald. And so sun scald on the plants, it, um, Define, it's defining a general category of fruit tissue injury. And that's typically the result of direct exposure to solar radiation. And this can cause economically important losses, especially in bell pepper production. There's research that has shown, you know, you can have sun scald damage up to, you know, 30% 30, 30 of your crop can be lost due to that. Um, at, at Iowa State, I conducted research on shade cloth placement on high tunnels. So those same seven pepper cultivars I talked about, um, we, used, we used high tunnels. They were single poly Quonset high tunnels. And we had the peppers growing inside. And one treatment was no shade cloth. One treatment we have put on a 30% light reducing shade cloth. And the other treatment was a 50% light reducing shade cloth. And these were black knitted shade cloths that were placed on these tunnels. Placement was when temperatures were starting to exceed 90 degrees um, somewhat regularly. That tended to be the middle, tended to be the middle of June in both 2017 and 2018 when this research was conducted. And those shade cloths did stay on until the end of the season in September um, it, within each year. And what we found in our research is that light levels within those high tunnels were reduced just from the plastic alone about 17%. And then when you added that 30% shade cloth and that 50% shade cloth, we were, we were, you know, having an additive effect of shading. So we were really shading closer to 50% and 65% within those systems. And as a result of that, we did see a reduction in sun scald, although the no cover treatment we, we had very low levels of sun scald to begin with in these pepper production systems. And what we did find is there was a, a significant decrease in per plant yield of marketable peppers when we went all the way up to 50% shade cloth. So if you were going to use a shade cloth for your production system, 30% would be the absolute maximum I would recommend. And I would encourage you to consider 10 to 20, especially as you think about the plastic um, adding a shading effect on the tunnel as well. And it's important to remember with peppers, they're very sensitive to heat and you can see a lot of flower abortion due to high heat, which was another goal of ours with the, with the shade cloth placement was to reduce the, those heat levels within the high tunnel, which we did successfully but we overcompensated with shading, which can also lead to flower abortion. So if you're someone who's considering building a high tunnel in the near future, I would consider you to think about roof ventilation and um, at the very least having gable ventilation so that you can cross ventilate and get some of that heat out of the upper level. Um, there, there's evidence to support you know, having having ventilation in your high tunnel may be more beneficial than than shading for high tunnel conditions. So, say if you had uh, both ends door or ends open up and the side open up, would you still recommend rafter ventilation? I would recommend considering it. Um, 
especially on the front end, because it's easier to install those things on the beginning versus the end. I don't have any hard data in front of me to speak to that, but it would be something worth looking into. And I would just ask people to pause and think about how they're how they're using shade cloths for pepper production, since they are um, can be can be more sensitive to shading. Okay, thank you. Um, what pests do we keep for tomatoes and peppers? What pests do we keep an eye out more common in high tunnels than the field? You know, me or not really. <laughs> I was going to say, based on my experiences and, you know, consulting with information from my, my, co-worker and collaborator, Dr. Rhoda Burroughs. I think two of the, the biggest pests to keep in mind for, for peppers and tomatoes in, in field or high tunnel conditions would be aphids and then our lepidopteran pests. So what, something that research supports and I can speak to as far as my own experiences with producing both peppers and tomatoes is having um, having a way to attract natural enemies of aphids can can be really beneficial for control. So there was research out of UC Davis looking, and this was working in lettuce fields, but they had interspersed plantings of sweet alyssum and demonstrated that the presence of sweet alyssum provided a habitat and a, and a nectar source um, for base, essentially it attracted lace wings, parasitic wasps and hoverflies, all of which can serve as control measures for aphids. And throughout my, my years at Iowa State, I integrated sweet alyssum plantings and the edges and corners of the high tunnel, you know, that outermost space next to the baseboard where things are, space is getting pretty tight anyways. I would just do a strip of transplanted sweet alyssum. And by the end of the season, it would be a thick blooming mat and it would just be, you know, kind of buzzing. You could see those hoverflies at work and, I didn't, I didn't take any measurements on this, but observationally, um, I never had issues with aphids in any year for pepper or tomato production. Um, additionally, I, it's really important to watch out for your lepidopteran pests. So things that are, are caterpillars. Um, I learned the hard way that you have to pay attention to what's going on underneath your mulch, um, especially in organic mulch. So in my research, I was using a, a switchgrass mulch around the pepper plants, and I did not realize right away that I had a cutworm, cutworm problem, and I started to see stem girdling. I didn't have things cut clear off. We never, we never identified exactly which cutworm it was. I worked with an entomologist at Iowa State, but we did, I believe it was two applications of Bacillus thuringiensis and also cleared back that mulch until those plants got a little larger. Um, so I would say for the first, we caught the problem probably at week two post transplanting and kind of backed the mulch off and did the spray application at that time and then put things back at about three to four weeks um, post transplanting. So that would be something to watch for. Um, observations on tomatoes, corn earworm can actually damage, especially tomato fruit. And I found in the year, again, this is observational, but I found in the year that there was corn planted closer to the where the tomato field was, that corn earworm was a larger problem. And again, for me at that point, the control measure became Bacillus thuringiensis. I also have observed, and this is some another lepidopteran pest to watch out for, would be keeping an eye out for tomato hornworm. Although these can be parasized um, um, by parasitic wasps. So that can be a control measure for you. I've seen an excellent photo from a farmer in Iowa that it was a tomato hornworm and it had been clearly parasitized and, and terminated out in the field. So there are, there are a lot of opportunities to attract um, 
beneficial insects into a high tunnel or a field situation. Now, um, we sometimes in our greenhouses, when we're growing transplants or doing other greenhouse activities, we'll have releases of beneficial insects, whether that's to control white flies or thrips or fungus gnats or aphids. But I would caution against doing those releases, even in a high tunnel setting, because research has demonstrated that the, those those insect, those released insects tend to leave and it's difficult to retain them in the high tunnel because, you know, here in the middle of summer, we're going to have, have things open and screening could reduce the ventilation capacity within the high tunnel. So there's, there's excellent resources both through universities as well as organizations such as the Xerxes Society that talk about the importance of having insectary strips. And especially in our annual cropping systems, those insectary strips will likely also be annuals themselves. So you should really focus on low cost, rapid blooming species. So in addition to sweet alyssum that I've talked about already, um, another one I can recommend, especially based on my own experience and observations is buckwheat, which we sometimes use as a fast growing cover crop. So that could provide double duty for you. It could be a, a summer cover crop and it could be again, another source of, of nectar, which will give, give some of those beneficial insects something to feed on. And so they'll stick around even if you don't have a pest problem. So they're already around and, and serving as a preventative measure. And some other great options, again, that are fast growing and the seed would be cheap is bachelor's button, dill, coriander, and in addition to things like zinnias and cosmos. So, um, and again, that's something that can fill nooks and crannies in the high tunnel or be a strip in the field. And depending on the stem length might also provide a small cut flower opportunity for your operation as well. Three, two, one. All right, uh, is there any trap cropping to help with uh, insects in high tunnel in production? You know, I, I'm certain that there's been research conducted on this area. And while I can't speak to it extensively, one good example that I'm aware of for trap cropping is if we wanna stick with solanaceous crops, um, as, as some of you listening may know, eggplant seems to attract a lot of flea beetles and that in addition to our brassica crops. Um, and research has shown that some of the, the mustard plants, so like the yellow mustards, can serve as a good trap crop for flea beetles. They tend to prefer that. And so in this case, when we talk about trap cropping, you're producing this alternative crop that is more desirable to the pest, such as the, the flea beetle in this case. And they, they tend to feed on that more heavily and not favor, for example, the eggplant as, as heavily. And that's an opportunity to then, you know, let them destroy that, but then, um, explore and use use resources such as the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide to come up with a plan to spray or control the, the pest on that alternative crop because it's now migrated away from your crop. But that's a great question, Charles, and I think a, a, a great potential topic to dig into with one of, one of SDSU's entomologists on a future recording. Okay. All right, uh, getting a little long on time here, so I'd like to thank Christine for sharing her knowledge with us. And uh, maybe we'll have to do one with her again because she's very informative. I would like to thank you for uh, sharing your time with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. And as people are looking for more information, again, I'll 
refer you to Dr. Ro Rhoda Burrow. She she does serve the commercial producers in the state, and I'm I'm happy and glad to collaborate on local foods initiatives and and some potential research. And you can you can find contact information for both of us in addition to other resources at extension.sdstate.edu, and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Well, that's a wrap for episode three of the South Dakota Special Producers Association podcast. Thanks for listening, everyone.